Hey, welcome here. Good to see you, and uh, welcome to all of our campuses that are joining us this weekend. If you uh, were away last weekend, I'll just uh, let you know that we are doing a five-week series uh, on the nature and the mission of the church. And you might wonder why that type of a series and why now? Uh, well, it's an important topic at any point in time, but in particular uh, because on April 4th, we made a decision as a church that we are going to build a larger worship center out back of the property here. And so as we talk about that, and particularly in the month of May, we're going to be asking all of you who belong to Northview, all of you who call Northview your church family, we're going to ask you to pray about how God would want you to participate in funding the building of that new building. It's a very important subject. Uh, it is a massive project, and our fear might be, or the danger might be, that in going into a building project, we could get sidetracked that we could get distracted, that we could somehow begin to think that the church was about a building. And so you're going to hear us say it several times over the coming weeks and certainly over the coming months uh, that, yes, we're building a building, but it's ultimately not about a building. Nod if you're with me. You understand? So last week we talked about the, the, the real importance of understanding what the church is and what the church isn't. Uh, that the fact that the church is not an organization, it is not an institution, it is not a denomination... It is not a building, although we use the word church for all of those things, but that fundamentally, the church is the people. Uh, so this word ecclesia that you see on the screen over the course of this series, ecclesia, the called out ones, the people of God, both Old Testament and New Testament, that God was calling a people unto himself, and that he has a purpose and he has a mission for his people. And so that's what we're talking about in these first few weeks. So last weekend, we started with the very first time that word church is used in the New Testament, and it was from Jesus' lips, when Jesus said, I will build my church. And we talked about the fact that there's only one reason that Jesus established the church, and ultimately it is for the glory of God. For the glory of God in the world, for the glory of God in our life, for the glory of God in the nations, for the glory of God in the city, and for the glory of God in our families. And so we're going to be talking about those five aspects over these weeks, for his glory, and for the good of the city, and for the good of his people, and for the nations, and ultimately for our individual families as well, that the church was established by Jesus unto his glory in all of these regions. Now you've heard us talk about the vision that we believe God has given to us as Northview, that not just for the local community and not just for our local church, but that we want to be part of seeing a gospel-centered church within reach of every Canadian. Because there are so many communities where the churches have closed their doors and where there is not a sound gospel teaching church anymore. And you say, well, why uh, is that important? Why is the local church in these communities important? Why is it important that people gather together as the people of God to worship and to be equipped? And then they scatter out into their everyday worlds. And that if there isn't a local expression of the church where they can be equipped and where they can worship together, how will people grow their roots down deep into God's word? So I'm going to put a picture uh, on the screen. And if you have uh, been around here uh, the last couple of years, you've seen me draw this several times. We're going to talk about it once right now, and then we'll come back to it later. But if we describe the church as just this giant box... And he said, everything within that quadrant is the people of God. It is the church. It is the ecclesia. Our entire life is represented in this box that we live in. That we could divide this box into four quadrants and say there are times large groups of people are gathered and then there are small groups of people and then there are times we are gathered together and there are times we are scattered. But all four quadrants represent the life of the church. So it is my uh, sort of opinion that I think when people talk about the church, when they say the church should do or the church is or the church whatever, that the vast majority of people are thinking about this box right up here. They're thinking about gatherings like this or maybe the small group. So maybe over here, a small group like a Bible study or a community group. But when you talk about the church and the people of God, I think by default, most people think of this side of the quadrant. It's when large groups of people are gathered and that's the church. And the institution or the organization of the church. And so when people say, why doesn't the church do whatever X, Y, Z? What they're really thinking about is the church gathered. But on the other side of this line, if you said everything here is sort of outside the world of our everyday experience, gathering is scattered out into the world... And so large groups, what do we do when we're scattered together? Think that through. That's an interesting thought. 
But small groups, most of us live the majority of our life in this box, right? So the church gathers, and so if you have 168 hours to the week, and actually you do, did you know that? We all get the same number of hours, 168 hours. And if God blesses you with nine hours of sleep a night, now does anyone in this room get nine hours of sleep? All the parents with newborn babies are going like, I only wish. So let's assume you sleep those 63 hours. That leaves you 105 waking hours. How many of those waking hours are you spending together with the gathered church? In a weekend service, maybe in a community group, maybe serving as some part of a volunteer team or whatever. But if you added it all up, I would guess most people would say it's 10 or 12 hours most weeks at the maximum that I spend together gathered with God's people. What are you doing with the other 90 plus hours of your week? And that is the most important subject that we're going to talk about tonight is this side of the quadrant, the church scattered. And what I want to try to convince you of tonight is very simply this, that the church should make the city a better place. That the church, the people of God, should make the city a better place. Now, somebody is going to push back right away, and you're going to say, you know what, that's not our business. The social and the political and the educational worries, those belong to somebody else. Those belong to government and social agencies. Uh, the church's business is to preach the gospel. Pastor, you should know this. Well, yes and amen. The church does exist to preach the gospel. But the question, is it only to preach the gospel? No. So Minnow Simons, a, a familiar voice around our sort of circles, said this, that true evangelical faith cannot lie dormant. Let's just put, no, no, go back. Just put a pause there. That evangelicals have always been an activist group, a people going out on mission. And then he went on to say the, the rest of the statement. It cannot lie dormant. It clothes the naked. It feeds the hungry. It comforts the sorrowful. It shelters the destitute. It aids and consoles the sad. It returns good for evil. It binds up that which is wounded. It becomes all things to all men. So that little sound bite is quite familiar to most people. But there are actually 10 other things in that list. So we quote seven of them is the most common sound bite from Menno. He actually listed 17 things that the people of God, the church, should be engaged in. And so as we venture on to build this larger worship and equipping center on the back of this property, we've got to ask ourselves, unto what end? And so last weekend, we talked about unto the glory of God. And this weekend, the impact that we're called to have on our community. And, and so there's probably no pastor currently living who has had a greater influence on my thinking about the city than a guy named Tim Keller. So Tim Keller has spent the last 34 years living in the heart of Manhattan in New York City, the largest city in North America, 34 years poured out for that community, literally on that island with millions of people. But his thinking is not new. In fact, it's been all through the history of the church. If you go back 130 years ago, another pastor by the name of Henry Drummond said this, to make good cities, that is what we're here for. To make good cities, that is for the present hour, the main work of Christianity. For the city is strategic, and he who makes the city makes the world. Now, what's really interesting is that Henry Drummond's book is actually about the book of Revelation. It's a book unpacking the prophecies of the new Jerusalem and the new heavens, the new earth, and the city. Did you know that we're going to spend eternity in a city? The city of Jerusalem. A new Jerusalem coming down from the heavens. And so he writes about that new city that we are waiting for. But he says, in the meanwhile, well, boy, am I hitting a puberty now. In the meanwhile, <laughs> we're waiting for that city. We have a responsibility in the town's the villages, the communities, the cities that we live in today. If you go back even further, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, St. Augustine's famous work, The City of God, and basically this book tells the tale of two cities that are intermingled. Or you might say like Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares, that they grow up alongside one another. He talks about the city of God and the city of Satan, that we live in a culture that is, uh, has these two streams alongside each other uh, continually. 
and that the city of God lives in a countercultural movement in the midst of the city of Satan. And, and what I would say in summary of that book, if you wanted to boil down that entire book to one simple thought, it is this thought that Christians make good citizens. It's really what he was on about in the fourth century AD. But go back even further. Go back to the Apostle Paul. We studied the book of Philippians last year, and in chapter 2, Paul said this, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, if you remember the Philippian church, it was started with a core group of three. The Apostle Paul lands into this village, and the three first people to become part of that church was a wealthy businesswoman named Lydia, and then at the opposite end of the social spectrum, a slave girl. And then in the middle, you had this blue-collar government worker, a jailer. So you have a rich woman, a slave girl, and a jailer is your core team for the first church in Philippi. When he writes back to them, he says, you know what? The impact that you're going to have on this Roman village of Philippi is going to happen in a very simple way. You want to grab people's attention and be a light in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? Let me give you one principle. Stop griping. That's what Paul said to them, right? Stop grumbling and complaining. Live your life as lights in the middle of the darkness. But let's go back even further. Back to the Old Testament. Back to Jeremiah 29, and this will be our key text for the day. Jeremiah 29, it is a powerful message calling God's people to engage for the good of the city and for God's purposes. And so we're going to start by putting on the screen one of the most popular Old Testament verses that I am sure that you have heard many, many times over the years, probably as baptism testimonial verses. Uh, you've seen it on posters and plaques and on coffee mugs, and you've probably seen it on a t-shirt somewhere and maybe even on a bumper sticker. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, many translations say in that word welfare, plans to prosper you. And that is a good translation. And as North Americans, we love that word, don't we? Woo, he wants to prosper me. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. So it is a powerful promise and it is truly a wonderful promise. But it is even greater when you understand the original context that it was set in. You see, that amazing promise was written to a people who were living as refugees. It was written to a group of people who were political exiles. They were living in a foreign land. They were under an oppressive political dictatorship. They were far from home and they were far from everything familiar. They were in a place where nobody would choose to live. The context was the Babylonian exile. And so, so many Old Testament books center around this period in time. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the three major prophets to do with the before and after of this period of time. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther were all written during this period of time. Haggai, Zechariah coming out of this period of time. There is so much of our Old Testament centered in on this particular period of time. But we get a glimpse of the heart of the people in Babylon at this time when you read Psalm 137. So the first six verses read like this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remember Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres. Those are electric guitars. <laughs> For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. So you can read it and you can hear the distress in their voice. And if you put it into the tone in which it would have been said, it's like our captors are asking us for songs. They're mocking us. They're saying, sing the songs of Zion. God, how can I sing your songs in this God forsaken land? That's the tone that it would have been said with. And so if we had to boil Psalm 137 down to just three simple words, you could summarize it with these three words. This place sucks. That's the summary. And when you know the story, 
you can totally understand where these people were coming from. Because most of them had lived through the greatest time of national revival in Israel's recent history. Under the godly leadership of a king named Josiah, the boy king who took reign at age eight and by age 26, just as a young adult, began to lead that nation in renewal and revival. But as you read the story, you will know that that revival was not long lived. And it did not have long reaching effects because the majority of the nation grew very quickly cold and complacent. And even after Josiah, there were some crying out to the Lord, God, when will you step in? When will you revive your people, Lord? How long can you let the people of God go living like this? Lord, when are you going to step in? Because Israel is unraveling. Habakkuk was one of those voices. He was a contemporary to Isaiah. And Habakkuk said this. He's talking to the Lord. And he says, oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Talking about his own people. Oh, you cry violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Now, you need to know that Habakkuk is not writing about the nations around. He is talking about his own people, the people of Israel. How long do I have to look at all this wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. It sounds an awful lot like many Christians in North America today are talking about the condition of the church in North America today. And Habakkuk is like, how long, Lord, are you going to wait? And then the Lord answers him and it is not what Habakkuk expected. Because he goes on to say, look among the nations, Habakkuk, and see, wonder and be astonished, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I have told you. So I'm going to do something. Behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans was another name for the Babylonians. So Habakkuk cries out to the Lord, and he's like, Lord, you got to do something. You've got to revive your people. And the Lord's like, that's great. I'm going to send the Babylonians to invade you. What? That's not what I expected, Lord. That's not the answer that I was looking for. How, Lord, could you use a wicked nation to judge your own people? How could that be? But a few short years after that revival, under Josiah, God does send Babylon to chasten his people, and Jerusalem falls. All the elite... The educated, the political families, the wealthy families, the artisan class, anybody who's a mover and shaker in the culture was deported 900 miles across the desert over to Babylon, and the prophet Jeremiah is left behind in Jerusalem with basically the poor, the lowest class of society who Nebuchadnezzar must have thought they have no influence whatsoever, we'll just leave those people there, we'll take anybody of influence with us to Babylon. And in the midst of that, Somebody emailed Jeremiah. And they said, hey, you need a copy of this song that we're singing over in Babylon. Psalm 137. This place sucks. Here we are in a city that we never wanted to be in. We were dragged here as prisoners of war across this inhospitable desert 900 miles from home. We're sitting here on the muddy Iraqi river being mocked and ridiculed. Can it possibly get any worse than this? Now, I have said this many times, but it's just worth saying again. Because imagine this. It today is though 900 miles east of us. That means Saskatchewan. So they invade us. And they drag all of the important people, which of course is all of us, and they drag us across the mountains and they drop us, 900 miles is about swift current, and they say, now here's where you're going to live. And then we go, oh God, how could you possibly forsake us and put us along the muddy South Saskatchewan River and think that we can praise you in this God-forsaken land? That's the analogy. The emotions are raw. How can we sing in this land? How can we hold our heads high? Now, Jeremiah 29, to get to our text, finally, the message will start, is a letter from Jerusalem to those who are in Babylon already. And it was their context. And in a lot of ways today, we might feel like it is our context. When you want to hang up your harp on the willows, your electric guitar, when you want to silence your singing voice, when you have packed away your dancing shoes, 
When you're saying, Lord, do you not see what's going on in the world around us? Lord, when are you going to step in? And we might really be surprised how the Lord answers those kind of prayers. And Jeremiah 29 is the answer. So the first verse, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent to, from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile. From Jerusalem to Babylon. We'll drop to verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And then we'll drop down to verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill my promise and bring you back to this place, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Okay, there is so much in this text. But just three things I want to point out very quickly. Number one, and obviously, it is written for dark days. It is just obvious. Hardly needs to be said. When the world is unraveling, when it feels like you have no hope. Now, we read this text, and immediately, I think, in our minds, we want to jump to the promise of, I'm going to restore your fortunes. I'm going to bring you back. The promise is there, but remember, it's seven decades later. So this means 2093, 2023, 2093, he's going to bring us back. You're like, great, most of us aren't going to be alive. Thanks, Lord. But God writes and says, hey, when you feel like the world is unraveling, when you feel like you have been defeated and conquered and all alone and far away from home, you think you have no power and no influence, let me tell you what I think of you. I have got good plans for you, even in the midst of this cesspool you find yourself in. And so many of us need this message even today because of the season of life that we happen to find ourselves in. I know in our congregation, there are always people asking the question, God, where are you? God, what is it you're up to in my life? And it, it may be simply a heavy burden that you're under right now. It may be some form of loss. It may be a time of pain, of abuse. Whatever the situation is, there are constantly people asking these questions. God, where are you? God, have you forgotten me? And Psalm 137 asked, how can I sing your praise basically when all hell is breaking loose around me? But remember, friends, the church has always historically been at her best in times of great trial. In fact, there's many people telling us that the the strongest church today on the planet is the church in China under the thumb of communist China, that they are probably the strongest, most faithful believers Uh, A quote that I love, and so you get to hear it again and again, Carl Truman. Every age has its darkness and its dangers, and the task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives. That's why I like his quote, because I like the word whine. The task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which we live, but to understand its problems and to respond appropriately to them. That's our job. Secondly, God is sovereign. Written for hard times, dark days, but God is sovereign. Note it very clearly that it was God who orchestrated this event. Did you note that when we read the text? To those whom Nebuchadnezzar dragged across the desert, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar did this, and from there on out, Nebuchadnezzar gets no credit whatsoever. 
If you will look at verse 4, verse 7, verse 14, and verse 20, you see it again and again and again and again. Four times the Lord says, I sent you to exile. Verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar dragged you across the desert. Four times God says, I sent you into exile. In fact, back in Jeremiah 25, he had said, this judgment is coming, and I'm going to send my servant, a guy named Nebi. Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, not a God-fearing man, and God calls him my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to drag you across the desert. And so in God's sovereign plan, he moves the nations. He sets up kings and kingdoms. And he brings judgment sometimes on nations and sometimes on his own people so they will turn back to him again. And there are so many myriads of stories around this, but one I think that is so important for you to understand and to think about, if you have never pondered it this way, do you know why Northview Church exists today? Among many other things, do you know why we exist today? If you go back far enough in history, this church exists because of communism. And you're like, what are you talking about? Well, let me tell you, let me ask you to raise your hands. How many of you would trace your family history back to Russia? Somewhere through, look around the room. Somewhere your greats, your great greats, or whatever. A hundred years ago, there was a revolution on the other side of the world. And Joseph Stalin decided that he was going to crush the church. He was going to destroy the church. He was going to kill the church. And what he did was he sent tens of thousands of people around the world taking the gospel of Jesus with them. Many of them came to Canada. Some of them were Mennonite brethren, Christian people, and the very first church in Canada was a little place called Winkler, Manitoba. You ever heard of it? The very first church in our family, and eventually it began to spread across the country. And the very first church in British Columbia in our denomination was in a little place called Yarrow, BC. Anybody ever heard of that? And every other Mennonite Brethren Church in our province traces its heritage back somewhere, ultimately, to Yarrow, BC, that came from Winkler, Manitoba, that ultimately came from Russia. Why? Because of communism trying to squash out the people of God. We should thank God for Joseph Stalin that we have a church today. Is that not weird? And yet God in his sovereignty uses even pagan kings to advance the glory of his name. God is sovereign. And those may be the hardest words for us soft North American Christians to think about and hear, but what if the very best thing that could happen to the church was that all of our cultural supports were removed? Thirdly, seek shalom. What's so significant about God's answer in Psalm 137, that complaint is what he did not include. He didn't include any mention of getting into political office. And although we know that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were powerfully used by God at the highest levels of government, he didn't say, try to get elected to government. There is no mention of trying to bend the will of the king, although we know that later a beautiful young woman would be married against her will, a woman named Esther, to the king, and she would be instrumental in the salvation of her people. And there is no mention of making plans to get back home or to revolt or to rebel. And yet we know that Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai and Zechariah ultimately led a return. Instead, it is a countercultural movement from within. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. So challenge is to seek the shalom. The welfare and the peace of the place that I've taken you. Settle in, build houses, plant gardens. Marry and give your kids in marriage. In other words, engage the culture where I have placed you. Here in this land where you feel oppressed, I am going to bless you. And, and here's where it gets intensely practical for each one of us. The huge implications for the church family as a whole is the question, how are we going to engage the culture around us? 
And so there's a ton of authors that write on this, and they come at it from various perspectives, and many of them I've put on the screens before over the years, but most interesting, and just for short of time, I think is the comparison between the four people groups that surrounded Jesus in his first century ministry. Among the people of God, so these were in the nation of Israel. These are not outsiders. These are the people of God themselves. So we would say the church. And there were these four groups. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Those are the four major groups in that New Testament first century. And the Pharisees stood on the outside of the culture in judgment. The Pharisees thought they were better than everybody else. They looked down their spiritual nose. They didn't engage. They didn't dirty themselves in the culture. Today, we would call them the fundamentalists. The Sadducees were the opposite. The Sadducees, or Herodians, got in bed with the culture. They said, you know what? You could get along in the culture if you will just keep your faith and your public life separate. Do your faith thing over here, your church thing over here, and just keep it private, keep it quiet, and do your public life over here, and the two shouldn't meet. Just go with the flow. And today, we call those people liberals. The zealots are those who say, we got to throw over Rome. It's Barabbas and his like. If we could just get a powerful evangelical voice in Ottawa, we would win the war. And the extremes of the religious right, in fact, today we call them the religious right, and it's why I've said this again and again, we have got to rescue the word evangelical. Because right now in North America, the word evangelical is a dirty word in the, in the large cultural thing, Right? And why? Because of the extremes on the far right that would basically say, we want to take over the country. And yet it is a strong biblical word. It means the good news. It is the gospel. We are people of the evangel. So we cannot lose that word evangelical. But the zealots were with Jesus and they're with us. And then the Essenes who literally withdrew. They packed up the wagons and they started the Qumran communities on the north shore of the Dead Sea. They literally formed, we might call them the Amish or the Hutterites. We might call them the MEI families. <laughs> I just have to say that every time because it's just so funny. Or those of you who listen to Praise 1065. They lived in a world unto themselves. Now, I think that the two categories that most North American Christians fall into are the first and the last. We either stand on the outside looking down our noses at the culture or we isolate ourselves from the culture. And here is the kicker that none of those approaches will lead to the deep change that is needed. And if I hear the context correctly, what I see and hear God saying to these people is this, I don't just want you to build great marriages and families. And I don't just want you to build great synagogues, which came out of the Babylonian exile, or another organization. I don't want just another church building on the corner of another town. I want you to pour your life out for the good of the nation, for the good of the community, for the good of the city. In other words, what we talk about, the flourishing of the city. That the common grace of God is poured out through his people. But don't miss the impact. Because those very same people have been singing Psalm 137. How can we sing the songs of God in this land? And the answer is pray for your city because as it prospers, as the common grace of God is poured out, so too will you. So to bring it to a close, what does it mean for Abbotsford, Mission, and the Fraser Valley to prosper? And I don't know how you read Psalm 137, but I think a lot of North American Christians are living Psalm 137 lives. That we feel like we are on the banks of the muddy Fraser River and we should just sit down and weep. Because how long, Lord, until you step in and bring renewal and revival and a fresh wind to your spirit? And oh God, that he would. But I want to just put up three things. Our words matter. Language matters. And so when people talk about the church Go back to last week's message. If you didn't miss it, ask them, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about an organization, an institution, a building, or are you talking about the people? Because that's what the word means. And then another great word from last week, an apostolic church, one holy apostolic Catholic church. And when you combine those two words, ecclesia and apostolos, apostolos, the apostolic church, that word literally means the sent ones. 
So you have the ecclesia, the called out ones, and the apostolos, the sent ones. So the church is the people who are called unto God and then sent right back out again. He calls us in and he sends us out. He calls us in and he sends us out. Amen? Words matter. Secondly, our individual and collective impact matters. So here's where these four quadrants, I think, to just talk about them a little bit matter. Because we could talk, and it's easy to talk about our collective impact. So we could say over here in this big square, together as a family of congregations across our city, that we can do a lot of good together. And so primarily we think of we collect a lot of money from generous people to give to community organizations. And we partner with a number of community organizations that we have been able to be incredibly generous because of your generosity. To be involved in serving, and that's really easy. You can write a check. That's an easy thing to do. And so when people say the church should do X, Y, Z, what are they talking about? You see, we can give to partners, and, and like you go back to the flood relief, many, many volunteers who are mobilized. There, there's this little new thing that maybe you've not heard. In fact, I know you haven't heard about it because it's just going to be announced. The Abbotsford Sanctuary and Aid Program that came out of the, the flood response. Emergency social services said we need a frontline response for when an emergency happens, we need several facilities around the city. Can we get some churches on board to say on the drop of a hat, can we call you and within a couple hours you can have your facility open for people in distress. And so we tested it by default about a year ago. I, you, most of you won't know this. There was a fire over an apartment house on Mount Lehman Road early in the morning. Those people had nowhere to go. And these guys called us and said, hey, could you open up center court? And we're like, sure. Put on a pot of coffee. About 150 people showed up, most of them in their pajamas. And they hung out here. Some of them had to hang out here two days until they could get into housing. So those kind of responses are things we can do together, right? Now, many of you don't know that we actually own three buildings. We own Downs Road, we own a church over in Mission, and we own a commercial space down on Ware Street that a lot of people don't know that Northview has a building on Ware Street because there's no Northview name on it. It's where Cyrus Center does their ministry to teenagers off the street. The beautiful thing about it is Cyrus Center can work out of our building for free, and they can serve homeless teens off the street. What an amazing thing that we can do together. But frankly, friends, I think our greatest impact, those are all things wonderful, but our greatest impact, I don't think, is here. I think our greatest impact is here with the thousands and thousands of hours and conversations that we have, the 90 hours that we are not together when we are out. Like, and I've said this many times, who is the best person to reach a nurse or a barista or a construction worker or a stay-at-home mom or a lawyer or a you-name-your-vocation? Who's the best person to reach them? Another person embedded in that world, right? Who knows what they're up against. And so we have been saying that we exist to help people become deeply rooted followers of Jesus. And the reason is, so we get our roots down deep, we gather, we grow, and we go, and we go out. And so words matter. Our impact matters. And then finally, just this thought. Where we start matters. And notice where God tells these people to start. The very first thing he says to them is, would you pray? Would you pay, pray for the leaders? Now, think this through. Pray for Nebuchadnezzar. Pray for the guy who just conquered us and dragged us across the desert. Yeah, pray for him. Pray for all those in power and pray for everyone else in this nation because as this nation prospers, so to you, you will, will you. Uh, you've heard the analogy, I'm sure, of in military war, the air war and the ground war. That the airplanes go in ahead, bombing strategic targets, and then the ground troops follow. And some have compared spiritual warfare in the same sense that prayer is like the air war that goes ahead. It opens up the doors. It opens up opportunities. And so pray for your friends, your neighbors, your workplace, your family. A, a year ago, we started praying five by five by five. I challenge you, encourage you. Would you spend this year, would you talk to five people that you know and love who are far from God and say, I'm gonna spend five minutes a day, five days of the week, asking the Lord to move in their life. I've heard so many stories from many of you saying, do you know what God's doing through my five by five, five prayers? Just simply 
That's all they did. What if we would do this? What if we got every person who earned their living in the educational system together in one setting and said, we're gonna do nothing else, but we're just gonna pray. We're gonna pray for education. What if we got every medical worker in the Christian community together and say, we're gonna do nothing else, we're just gonna pray for the medical world. What if we could get a group of business leaders together and go, we're not gonna strategize a bunch of other stuff, we're just gonna pray for Christian business leaders. What if you got a group of chicken farmers together and said, let's pray for the chicken industry. What might God do? So starting next week, and all the way through the month of May, we are gonna be asking you to help fund a new building. And what I wanna remind you of is that it is not about a building at all. But it is what God is doing through us and that the church is here, yes, last weekend we talked about it, to glorify God, but the church is also here to make the city a better place. The church exists for the glory of God, for the good of the city, for the good of God's people, for the good of the nations, and for the good of the family. And I hope that that is a mission and a vision that you can get excited about and that you can get behind all in. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to pray. We'll sing. We'll be on our way. So, Lord Jesus, I pray for the men and women uh, at all of our sites, Central Abbey, Mission, East Abbey, and here at Downs. Lord, you know our stories. And I want to pray particularly this weekend for people who might feel like, for whatever reason, they are living Psalm 137 right now. And their prayers and their cries to you are like, Lord, I don't know how much more I can take. Because this place I'm living in, this situation I'm living in, this circumstance that I am butting up against, I don't know how much more I can take, Lord. And then you answer them. And you said, you know what? I am sovereign over your life. And I put you in this place. And now I'm giving you this challenge. Settle down. Bloom where you're planted. Raise your families. Honor God. And pray for the world around you. And Lord God, would you anchor us back to the fact that you are indeed sovereign over our lives. And Lord, would you give a vision to us for what the Fraser Valley could look like if the people of God in those thousands and thousands of hours that we spend outside the gathering, if we were actively being salt and light, what you might do in our lifetime. Lord, give us that vision, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.